Can we have another round of applause for Tacoma Academy? You know, we often don't know how, how, uh, how well we have a certain situation until we just don't have certain things in that situation. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're very privileged to have a school that has a great music program. <laughs> if you've ever been to a school spring program, or fall program or Christmas program and you were wishing you were somewhere else, you understand what I'm talking about because those programs don't necessarily happen in our schools. We have great teachers, we have great students who are willing to work. I just want to thank again Lulu, my colleague and friend in Tacoma Academy for bringing us music this morning. Uh, some of my fondest memories of, uh, of high school were at Tacoma Academy in the Camerata. And uh, yeah, I can give them a round of applause. Cam Camerata. And um, did a lot for shaping me for who I am today. Although I didn't graduate from Tacoma, I consider myself an alumnus of Tacoma as well. <laughs> Pine Forge, okay. <laughs> so one afternoon, I remember getting a phone call from my cousin saying, Hey, Anwar, we have tickets to go to the Washington Redskins football game and we want to go on your birthday. You see, I was literally beside myself because everyone in my family is a Washington Redskins fan. Well, for the, for the most part, except for my, my wife's side, who uh, have been deceived by the false prophets, also known as the Detroit Lions. <laughs> uh, the game started at 8 p.m. on a Monday, and if you know anything about tailgating culture, you're aware that although the game starts at 8, you're in the parking lot from about 4 or 5 p.m. There are bands playing, clowns putting on shows, kids in a moon bounce, people grilling all types of veggie links and grillers, and they're drinking tons of Martinelli's. You know, for this story, that's where we're going to keep it. We're going to keep it that way for this story. Nonetheless, the atmosphere is electric. People are dressed for the occasion with uniforms, team colors, retired jer jerseys, and anything that resembles the pride of being a true fan. When the pregame tailgating is done, you walk into the stadium and find your seats. Of course, before the game actually starts, there are a number of preliminaries, including the singing of the national anthem, a moment of silence for the troops, special recognitions for alumni, or a lot of other things. Then came the introduction of the home team. As each of the home team players were introduced, the announcer would read all the good, the good stats of each player before declaring their name to the thousands of listeners. And at the conclusion of each name, the stadium would erupt in cheers. Firecrackers are shot into the air, F-16s fly over by, uh, overhead, and, and while their highlights are being played on the big screen to the loudest music possible. You know, it's a very, very electric environment. Well, as the game started, the crowd will settle down a bit, uh, with the exception of when the Redskins would score. You know, even though we were losing 28 to 7 at the end of just the first quarter, the, sans, the, the fans sang with all their might, Hail to the Redskins, hail victory, fight on the warpath, fight for old D.C. Uh, well, being the minister of music and worship at this church, I couldn't help but make some striking parallels. The whole football game experience felt like church. Everyone knew where to show up. They knew where to park. They knew what to wear and even what songs to sing. They knew when to be silent out of respect and when to offer praise. People sang with sincerity, faith, and passion, even when they feel as though they are losing in a losing situation. There is fellowship before and after the event, and whatever the outcome of the meeting, win or lose, 
poor preaching or powerful worship, everyone remains loyal to the cause. The only behavioral difference between the game and church lies in what happens when the game is over. You see, for a true fan, the game is never over. The fandom continues. It shapes their life. Team bumper stickers, team flags uh, in cars, blankets, jerseys, pens, coffee mugs, and all sorts of paraphernalia infiltrate the day-to-day life of a true fan. How many times have you been to a barbecue or a cookout and see someone wearing a sports jersey or a baseball cap? Or how about waiting in the doctor's office only to see a sports magazine sitting on the table? And the small talk at the water cooler at work or in between classes or in the calf? (laughs) You're always talking about who's going to make the playoffs. This is no accident. The sports industry is completely aware of its impact on society. They know they have a good product, and they push it in their marketing so that fans like me are consistently and constantly thinking about the next game. The NFL season, for example, lasts only five months, but somehow it remains relevant for all 12. They have managed to establish their own culture of believers and followers who are unashamed to share or even brag about their home team if they're, even if they are out of town. You see, being a true fan of a team becomes part of your identity, and it is seen by others in the way you conduct your life. On the other hand, church is a bit different for some of us. We know we ought to be here, but we may come out of obligation rather than desire. We participate in what has taken place only to leave and not really think of church again for another six days. For some, there is joy in the time we spend together. Similar to being a sports fan, this joy of Christianity bleeds into our everyday life. But for some among us, our actions seem routine and mundane. We know what we are doing, but we don't completely understand the reasons why or the spiritual implications of our actions. This leads to confusion, which leads to frustration. And the next thing you know, you're putting in a membership transfer because something isn't right with that congregation. I would submit that many of us need a renewed mindset when it comes to our understanding of worship. I'll invite you to pray with me at this time. Father in heaven, as you have done many times before, I pray that you um, just use me. I pray that no one necessarily hears me, but they hear your voice and they're convicted uh, convicted by the words that you have to share with them as well. Um, Bless us and our time together is what we ask in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Does everybody have a study outline? A study outline should have came in your bulletin. It's it's an outline for this sermon. If you do or if you don't, um, if you don't, our ushers may have some available in the back or you may have them in there. I know when I was in college, I didn't necessarily like going to church. They made us going to church. They made us go to church because, um, you know, you get the RA would check to see if we had to go to church. And one of the things that engaged me sometimes, the speakers had little things, little fill-in-the-blank things that you could follow along in the message. So that should be in there with you. So the first item on the on the site that says, "What is worship?" The first item is, "What is worship?" What is worship? Worship is our response to God's invitation into a relationship with himself. God is the initiator of worship. Let me repeat that again. Worship is our response to God's invitation into a relationship with himself. God is the initiator of worship. He is the author of worship. Worship is something made possible for us by God. We cannot worship him without an invitation from him. To get a clear understanding of what God intends for our corporate worship to be like. Oh, I see some ushers passing them out. If anyone needs a worship outline, or uh, uh, this, this uh, outline here, just give your hand, raise your hands. We have some down here. Thank you, ushers, for being on top of this. We'll continue on for now. To get a clear understanding of what God intends for our corporate worship to be like, we must look at the Bible. The first example of our corporate worship takes place in the book of Exodus. So let's look at Exodus 19, chapter 4. Here we see Moses heading up to the mountain to meet with God. It was here that Israel was to be established as a church under God, and this was what God tells Moses, starting in verse 4. 
he says, You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Verse 5, Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you are to speak to the Israelites. Let's pause there. This is one thing I really do appreciate about God. You see, when he speaks to us, there's no guessing. There's no on-the-fence dialogue. There's not even any small talk, (laughs) at least in my case. (laughs) When he speaks, he is clear. In the text that we just read, he wants to enter into a sacred relationship with us. But there are clear stipulations for this relationship to work. If you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then you are mine. It's it's wonderful that God is open in his desire to be in a relationship with us. The beauty of this relationship is later reflected in Jeremiah when God says, listen, I will be their God and they will be my people. (laughs) That sense of ownership is beauty. It's beautiful. It's very beautiful. Let's continue on with verse 7. Verse 7. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. Let's skip down to verse 10. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And let's move down to verse 16. It says, on the morning of the third day there was thunder and lightning, with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. So from the text we just read, you can see that this was very dramatic. There's lightning, thunder, fear and trembling, and everything of that nature. You have to remember now, this is the first time that the body, that a body of people were introduced to the physical presence of God. Prior to this, God exposed himself only to individuals, Adam and Eve in the garden, Abraham, Isaac, you know, all the patriarchs. God met them and he revealed himself to them individually. So this meeting had a lot of significance. Now, there are four key elements of worship, four key elements of worship. This whole Exodus passage is key because it sets, it sets up these elements, a structural, the structural elements for meeting between God and his people. These elements are the very substance of our corporate worship. The first element is a call to worship. A call to worship. Let's look at verses 10 and 11 one more time. If you get those on the screen. Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all his people. You see, God sent an invitation through Moses, for his people to meet him at the foot of the mountain to worship. As stated earlier, God calls us into worship. We cannot worship God without this invitation. Well, similarly, similarly today, we have a long-standing weekly invitation that we respond to. We call it Sabbath. <laughs> for many adults, anticipation for Sabbath is equivalent to a toddler's anticipation for Christmas. It just can't come soon enough. <laughs> so what do you do? You finish the work and the chores around the home. You put gas in the car, and if it's warm like it was this week, you may even wash it. You know, you even try to get to living well before 3 p.m. <laughs> See, on Sabbath morning, we play inspirational music. We put on clothes that were set apart just for that morning, and we make our way to God's house. Whether we realize, that, whether, whether we realize this or not, all of this is in response to God's call to worship. And it is, con- it is considered to God as an act of worship. So worship doesn't begin when we enter the door or when we choose to participate in a certain part of the service. Doing these things not only prepare our physical surroundings, but they prepare our minds and our hearts for encountering God in the corporate worship setting. <laughs> you see, I remember as a child on Fridays, I, I, I loved Fridays. Not only did school get out early, um, I had a sister. I love my sister, Jewel. She came home, and sometimes some of her friends would come home, and we would clean the house. But to you, you know, to, to like, you know, uh, 
uh, well, at least by the time I was in seventh or eighth grade, that, that was fun. Cleaning the house was fun. She made it fun. She put on music. You know, we opened the windows, opened all the blinds. We were singing throughout the houses. We were vacuuming and cleaning and so forth. I wasn't even aware that all of this built my anticipation for seeing my friends on, Saturday, on Friday night for choir rehearsal and then seeing them again for Sabbath school. It made Sabbath such a wonderful experience, partly because I was rolling under the pews and, you know, doing laps around church and so forth. But the point is that it prepared you, it prepared me for worship. Similarly, here at Tacoma, as a response to this call to worship, your pastoral staff holds a staff meeting. We meet to pray over and plan the upcoming worship service. Information related to the worship service is then dispersed to the service participants later in the week. This is followed by a one call from our pastor on Friday. All of this contains information needed for worship. On Sabbath morning, both services start with a prelude. This is music that precedes the worship service. It may be in the form of an organist playing, the choir singing, or today we even had Tacoma Academy's band playing. Regardless, its start alerts worshipers that the service is officially beginning, and these actions also contribute, and are, I'm sorry, these actions are also done in response to the call to worship from God to worship. Let's look at verse 17 one more time. Verse 17, it says, Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Notice, everyone is involved. All 12 tribes, all elders, all priests, all families, old and young alike, the whole people of Israel went to meet God together at the foot of the mountain. This brings us to our second fundamental element of worship. Our second fundamental element of worship is participation. When we gather here on Sabbath morning, there are a number of things that are done, which God requires our full participation. The church life in our service highlights our church activity outside of Sabbath morning, and it is a reminder of how engaged we ought to be in ministry. By doing acts of service, we are continuing in worship. You see, there's a Greek term called latruin, And this word is used for worship the most in the New Testament. It is almost exclusively used in the context of service. Paul used this term frequently when discussing how our lives are to be in service to each other and to Christ, and how this too is an act of worship. When we act on the service opportunities made available here at church, God registers it as an act of worship. So for those of us who are still on the fence regarding service Sabbath, or joining a particular ministry, know that biblically, it is not only a part of our Christian responsibility, but God looks at it as an act of worship. The church life also draws our attention to the purpose of our gathering, which is stated in our mission and vision. The corporate recitation of our purpose coincides with what God has called us to do as a body of believers. It is verbal affirmation that supports the activities in the announcement that were just read prior. The final portion of the church life is the welcome and greeting of visitor, visitors. So some of you love this portion of the service because we can never get you to come back so we can start the opening song. It's great to establish more and more camaraderie among, among the worshipers who we're worshiping with. And then next in our service is the songs of praise and worship. Imagine if you would, being in the camp of, in the camp of Israel, The tabernacle is in the middle. There are thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. When it was time to worship, people would leave their tents singing, and they would walk to the walk to the tabernacle. Now, you've been to a parade. You've heard when one group passes, you hear another group in the distance. Imagine walking to church, no cars. Imagine walking to church, and there are just groups and pockets of people just singing, 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 singing. If you had a tough week, It was great to worship because you just jumped on the bandwagon. You couldn't help it. It was the culture of the time to approach the temple in worship. This is the reason why the Psalms tell us to come into his presence with singing and enter into his courts with praise. In the same way we play music in the car or on our mobile devices as we make our way to worship, the Israelites would leave their tents and sing all the way to the tabernacle for worship. In Old Testament culture, singing was both the custom and the prerequisite for entrance into the sanctuary for worship. So someone asked me recently, with total sincerity in their art, Anwar, 
Are we supposed to be singing with the praise team for the songs of praise and worship? I responded, yeah, yes, yes you are. The goal is for us to be singing together. Okay, 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 thanks. That's what I thought, they said. Because recently I started singing along, but someone shushed me and told me that we weren't supposed to be singing. Well, then I replied and I told them, well, just tell them that they're missing out. They're missing out on a wonderful opportunity. Church, do you ever sense something special when you're worshiping on Sabbath morning and we are all singing together? It's no coincidence that the tone in the room shifts because something special occurs. After all, it was in the upper room in the book of Acts where the Holy Spirit descended on those who were present because they were all on one accord. Because you see, everyone was praying. Everyone was engaged. Everyone's hearts were in it. And everyone was participating. I often wonder what blessings we miss when we are gathered and we are not gathered here on one accord. Well, next, the meeting of God between God and Israel was characterized by, here's our third point, the proclamation of the word. Our third point, the proclamation of the word. We were just in Exodus 19, and as we all know, in Exodus 20 is where God established with his people the Ten Commandments. God established with his people the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. You see, this set the parameters of the relationship that we are to have with God and with each other. Have no other gods before me. Do not make any graven images and worship them. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your parents. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not covet. Many of us stop there, but in chapters 21 to 24, he proceeds to elaborate on other things, other guidelines for idols and altars, employee-employer relationships, the welfare for the economy, social responsibilities, laws regarding the Sabbath and festivals, and and so on. You see, the idea here is that the relationship we are to have with God is intended to permeate every area of our lives, not just Sabbath morning worship. In our service, the proclamation of the word comes in one of three ways. Comes in one of three ways. The scripture reading, which is where we all stand together and read aloud God's word. The scripture reading. The music, which sometimes incorporates scripture, or has lyrics that are uplifting and focus on God's character. And of course, the preaching and the teaching from the pulpit. The preaching and the teaching from the pulpit. God can use any item in the service to communicate to his people. However, these selected items are the primary ways in which God's voice and instruction is clear. Because God spoke to the people of Israel through his commandments, this lets us know that worship is not complete without hearing from the Lord. The proclamation of the word is the capstone event of our meeting. It is the primary reason we come to God in the first place. I'll say that one more time. The proclamation of the word is the capstone event of our meeting. It is the primary reason we come to God in the first place. Whether in private or public worship, we all gather to hear a word from God. Finally, the covenant is confirmed and followed by the fourth element of worship, the response. The fourth element is called the response. So let's do a quick review. The first element is called a call to worship, right? The second element is called participation. The third element is called proclamation of the word, right? And the last element is called response. Let's look at the response of the people in Exodus 24, verses 5 through 8. Exodus 24, verses 5 through 8. Then he, being Moses, then he sent young Israelite men, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in bowls, and the other half and splashed it against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people, and they responded, let's say this, and they responded, we will do everything the Lord has said, we will obey. Verse 8 says, Moses then looked at the blood, then took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. That's kind of gross, but this is what happened. He he sprinkled it on the people. And this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all of these words. If only that could be our natural response as well. Everything the Lord has said, we will do. The people of Israel accepted the conditions of the covenant, signifying a commitment to hear and obey God's word. An essential part of our worship is continuous renewal of personal 
commitment. Continuous renewal of personal commitment. This involves sacrifice. Sacrifice. The Israelites offered blood sacrifices on behalf of their sins. And this was a dramatic symbol of agreement to the covenant. You see, in the Old Testament, God always used a blood sacrifice to demonstrate the sealing of a covenant relationship with his people. These sacrifices pointed to Jesus and his upcoming sacrifice. See, but today, we no longer do that. Rather, we offer our hearts and lives in sacrificial submission to God. This is why in the service we have an appeal after the sermon, why we have a song of response and not a closing hymn, why we have a collection of tithes and offering and a garden of prayer. All of these are done in response to the word that we have just received. The appeal and the song of response in particular offer every worshiper an opportunity to review their hearts, I'm sorry, to renew their hearts and commitments with God. And as for sacrifice, our lives are to show that we have given up certain things to follow Christ. One of my favorite verses is Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So as we can see, biblical worship is rooted in the covenant. In this passage, we see four areas where God is clear about what needs to happen for this relationship to work. As we obey his call to worship, we respond to his invitation by participating in the actions that engage us. Next, we receive the proclamation of his word, and finally we respond to what he said. In doing this, we're in compliance with what is expected from us when from God when we gather here to worship. What we learn from Moses and the Israelites serve as a reference point regarding what God requires from us while we are here. But you see, worship here was patterned after corporate worship in heaven. Since we now have a basis as to what worship involves here on earth, let's look and see what heavenly worship appears to be. Let's take another look at Revelation 4. If you could put that on the screen, starting with verse 1. It says, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. So let's pause right there. First, we see it again. An invitation from God to a human to participate in an activity. This is the first part of worship. Second, I don't know if you caught it, but the very voice of God is musical. He said, I heard a voice speaking to me like a trumpet. The speaking voice of God is musical. When I first read that, it just blew my mind. What does it sound like when he decides to make some music? (laughs) If he makes music as he talks, if his voice... Okay. (laughs) I guess I'll find out when we get to heaven, right? (laughs) Verse 2, it says, At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Pause there. Now, I have to pause here because you will notice that John doesn't quite know exactly what his appearance was. In the last verse, he described his voice as being like a trumpet, like something. All he had to compare, all he had to compare what he saw and heard were the things of this fallen world that he has been exposed to. He had the appearance of jasper and ruby, the rainbow, a rainbow that shone like an emerald and so forth. You hear like a sea, like a sea of glass. You know, these are all hypotheticals here. But aside from what is certain, which is streets of gold, cattle on a thousand hills, 12 gates, and an endless buffet known as the welcome table. Many other things are uncertain. I always find it interesting when people reference certain types of worship and certain types of music as something that is heavenly. Sure, it may draw our attention to heaven, 
However, I submit that everything this world has to offer drastically comes up short in comparison. If I may, let me submit to you an idea. Frequency. Before an orchestra or a band plays, you will hear a pitch come from a certain instrument. Usually this is the pitch of A. This is the two, this, this note on, on a certain frequency, um, this frequency is called 440. This frequency, 440, is considered the perfect frequency to which everything is in tune. The organ is currently tuned to 440, the piano is currently tuned to 440, and the instruments when they play, they are tuned to 440 as well. When instruments are not on the same frequency, they are considered out of tune. Now, this is just one of the frequencies that we can hear. There are many others. Well, have you, have you ever wondered why you may be sitting in your car and then you hear a siren from an ambulance or a police car, only to realize that you have no idea from where it's coming from? It's because those sirens are on a specific frequency. It's intentional that they want you to stop wherever you are so that they can pass, regardless of whether you know where they're coming from. Have you ever noticed that there are certain whistles that animals can hear that we cannot hear? It's because whatever they are hearing is on another frequency. Have you ever wondered how mammals can communicate to each other when they are underwater and they're miles apart? It's because they are on another frequency. Here on Earth, we humans are only able to hear certain frequencies. And of the frequencies we can hear, we find ways to produce sound and make music on them. The best example is your radio, right? Different frequencies, we can hear different sounds on them. But however, there are ones that we cannot hear. Can music and sound be made on those? Certainly, because the, music, the rules for music making apply for each frequency. However, we have not yet done so simply because we cannot hear on them. So, I imagine, so if you can, imagine with me the infinite amount of music and the infinite amount of sound that exists that we cannot hear simply because it's on another frequency. I believe that a part of the transformation that will occur when we are changed in the twinkling of an eye is that our ears will be opened. I believe that in heaven, the worship is infinitely times better and that the music made there is not bound to our earthly rules and understandings of frequencies. Remember, our baseline comparison for anything comes from this sin-ridden and fallen world where everything is imperfect. This includes the worship, this includes the music, and it even includes the jasper and ruby and emerald that John used to describe Jesus at the throne. So before you deem your preferred style of worship or genre of music to be heavenly, please remember that as long as we are here, scratching the surface of anything heavenly is literally impossible. It is Jesus that takes all of it. Our humble but broken worship, our sincere but dissonant music, and he makes it acceptable to the Father on our behalf. Without him, whatever we produce is just simply unacceptable, whether we think it is heavenly or not. I digress. So let's please continue reading in verse 4. If we can continue reading in verse 4. It says, Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their head. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumbles and, rumblings and peals of thunder. Does that sound familiar? Lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder, same elements that the Israelites met at, uh, at Mount Sinai when they met God. Verse 6, also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass. There it is again. Looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. And in the center around the throne, there were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. Let's skip to verse 8. Each of the four creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the, four, whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and say, 
You are worthy, O Lord. You are worthy, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. All of this incorporates the second element of worship, which is participation. So if you would notice with me a few things. Number one, God is the, at the center, and he is the focal point of heaven and of all worship. There is a lot happening. Lightning, thunder, rumblings, creatures, elders. See, there's a lot going on. But none of this seems to deter John from what is the main focal point in heaven, which is God on the throne. In our worship, there will always be distractions. If you're an usher, it's grumpy people. If you're a deacon, it's someone disrupting the service or doing something wrong to the building. If you're a praise team member, Anwar somehow forgot to give the, pra- the media team that one stands in the song, and now we have to get by on shaky memory yet again. <laughs> if you are a faithful member, you may have thoughts of your weekly, you may bring thoughts of your, thoughts of your weekly challenges may arise during worship. But whatever our situation is, our focus in worship should solely be on Jesus and not the distractions. Point number two, there are different groups worshiping the same God in different ways. We have 24 elders and four creatures. The elders have long white robes, golden crowns, and sit on thrones. The creatures are covered with eyes and wings. Again, these are two very different groups of people. They are singing different songs and functioning in different roles. However, they are both present worshiping God together at his throne. The moral of the story here is that we can worship God differently. We can. I promise you, we can do it. This portrayal is proof that God loves diversity in worship. Different songs from different people. So let us not impose our way of worship onto others. If someone wants to stand, let them stand. If they want to clap, let them clap. If someone wants to shout, thank you, Jesus, let them say it. And if someone just wants to sit and be quiet and bask in the presence of God, don't disrupt that for them. I'm speaking to myself. (laughs) I'm speaking to myself as well. There is no outward expression that confirms or denies whether someone is truly worshiping. (laughs) Worship happens in the heart. If someone, especially a fellow church member, worships differently, keep your attention on the only person that matters. Third point, sacrificial giving takes place in heaven. Sacrificial giving takes place in heaven. The 24 elders have white robes and golden crowns, and that that sounds a lot like what you and I will receive when we get to heaven as well. I haven't done the research in this area, but something tells me that the elders are both literal and figurative as they represent you and I, what you and I, and what we will be doing when we get there. So let's look at what they are doing. First, they assume a posture of worship and submission, bowing down. They lay their crowns down and worship God. You know, we hear this so often that it's become numb. You know, it's just another set of words. Uh, but what are they really doing? If you think about it, all they have is a crown and a robe. And they cast their crowns down at Jesus' feet. They are giving everything. They are giving all that they have. Even in heaven, they are giving up their crowns. That we work so hard to get here, we will give it up when we get to heaven. Worship requires sacrificial giving, not just of our finances, but of our time, of our gifts, and of all that we have. So it's simple, church family. We have not worshiped if we do not give sacrificially. In verses 6 through 10, John tells us of the lamb taking the scroll from the hand of God um, who's on the throne. To which the response was, you were worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. If you, and if you've been with us over the past couple of weeks, you've heard, our, you've heard our pastors begin to talk about um, the opening of the seven seals, which reveals something that is going to happen. While we won't get into that today, it's clear that this portion of the narrative represents the proclamation of the word. 
God speaking to us through each of the seals. This is followed by an overwhelming response to those who hear it. I like to call this escalating worship. You see, because in verse 9, it just starts with the elders, and then the, the beasts are added to it, the, the, the creatures. And verse 11 tells us then that angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands upon ten thousands, they join in. And then verse 13 tells us that every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth joined in worship. And then in response to all, even all of that worship, uh, verse 14 tells us that the four creatures and 24 elders fell down yet again and worshiped. So this, in, this concludes the fourth key element of worship, which is the response. You see, here's the center point of Christian worship. Christ is to be worshiped because he is creator, redeemer, and sovereign Lord of all. If the angels and creatures constantly proclaim God's unique power in his past, in the present, and in the future activities, how much more should we who have benefited from them do the same? They're speaking of things that he has done for us, and they can do it without ceasing. We are the recipients of the things that have been done, yet sometimes it's like a jack-in-the-box. You just got it. We, we have to wind it up for worship. We got to wind it up to give God just to say thank you, just to say thank you. Help us indeed. So these four elements of worship started in heaven, and they were instituted at Sinai, and we will continue them in heaven when Jesus comes again. It has always been God's intention to prepare us for an eternity in heaven. So while this will not be all that we do when we get there, it is a major part of it. And if we fail to understand the significance behind what we do here on Sabbath morning, not only do we just miss the point, but we'll be unable to participate when we get to heaven. So why is this so difficult? Sure, Anwar, it's easy to hear what I should be doing, right? Uh, but why does it feel unnatural or sometimes, sometimes uh, for me, uh, why does it feel unnatural sometimes to be sincere in my worship? Why is it difficult to worship when I am in pain or experiencing a challenge? Why do I not sense any special presence when I try to worship, even in my personal devotion? Well, why is my level of genuine interest in the church, or for God for that matter, on the steady decline? Well, when we look at our lives objectively, it's a bit easier to see why worshiping such a holy God can seem mundane and routine. You see, we live in a world today where everything is built around preference and independence. Things are tailored to our needs and wants, even on the very basic of levels. Consider this scenario. You wake up in the morning, you step into the shower, you set the temperature to the, to the, the water to the temperature of your choice. You use soap and hygiene products that you have, for, you have found work best for you. You use your toothbrush and your preferred toothpaste. You select and put on clothes that are fit just for you. Then you get in your car, sit in your seat with your seatbelt for one. And if you have a fancy car, you have a vehicle with dual temperature control. You can adjust the temperature on your side of the vehicle. If you take public transportation, the seats on the bus and train are no longer benches, but they are designated seats confined to a specific space for each traveler. If someone sitting next to you has belongings that spill over to where you are, we say that they are in my space. If you drive and someone cuts you off on the road, we say that they came into my lane. The old slogan for McDonald's was, have you had your break today? <laughs> If you eat at Burger King, you can have it your way. If you eat at Panera, you can pick too. <laughs> if you go to Chipotle, Subway, Potbellies, or the plethora of pizza shops out there, you can also buy food that is assembled based on your preferences. And once you take into account how our culture has, um, is enhanced with polls, surveys, focus groups, America has got talent, voting someone off the island, or having your, American, um, your Amazon items analyzed and re uh, recommended to you at the checkout online, it's easy to see how preference drives much of what we do. I know people like to bash technology and social media, but if we just take those things and just leave them out of the equation and look at how we cognitively function, it's no, way that, no wonder that we come to church with preferences on how we would like to encounter God. Which church are we visiting this week? Who's preaching over there? Who is singing over there? Is it a special day? Oh, I got to get to church early and get a seat. 
oh, it's communion today. It's going to be a long service. We're all guilty. We're all guilty. It's no wonder that we judge each other in worship through the filter of our preferences. And it's no wonder that we have preferences and how the omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient God should interact with us. This has contributed towards us losing a sense of awe and holiness that belongs to God. So church, we need a renewed mindset for worship. Knowing that we are naturally selfish beings and that it is tough for us to relinquish control or preference, we know that it will require work to adjust to and adapt to what God wants from us when we meet with him for worship. You see, worship is so much more than just a type of song or a mood that you feel in the, wor- in, in the service. Worship starts with the condition of our hearts. And while corporate worship can be uplifting, the consecration and rededication of our lives are important and they are a private matter. And until the church experiences worship renewal in our private lives, our corporate worship gatherings will always suffer. Our corporate worship is only a sum of what we as individuals are able to bring from our intimate moments with God. In our private moments with God, he reveals his holiness. Like when he was with Moses, he showed him his glory. This exposure then informs our reality to what is really happening in this space here when we come to worship on Sabbath morning. It brings humility, sincerity, and reverence in our response to his presence. You see, with this new mindset, worship will regain its awe, its excitement, its joy, and its wonder. The truth of his word will compel you to live a changed life. <laughs> Obeying, obey, obeying his, words will, um, his ways and his words will regain virtue, and the church will regain its moral authority on our world. When we look and see that heavenly worship focuses on one thing, God on the throne, we are encouraged to keep our focus, our daily focus, on him as well. When he is the focus, our lives turn into testimonies. We end up responding to his invitation by actively participating in the worship of service towards others. We begin to proclaim the word of God through our actions, which show his character. And lastly, we respond. We respond to what he has revealed to us by incorporating his word in our hearts and renewing our commitment to him daily. Today, God wants to enter into a relationship with each of us. While his word is true, and he is never changing, I believe a beautiful part about God is that his connection or relationship with each of us is different. Think about the people you interact with frequently. Each person has a different level of friendship with you. Even in, your mar- even in marriage or any relationship, each union, each pairing of individuals is unique. Because of this, God speaks to us individually, and he speaks to us differently. He knows our language and how we respond to his love, which is why when he tries to correct us or beckon us to him, each gesture is different for all of us. My path to heaven will be different from yours. It will be similar, but it will be different. Each of us have different things that we need to lay aside so that we can worship him fully. There are things, preferential things, that block and clog our hearts from his instruction. And he is asking us today to relinquish those things so that we can truly encounter him in our lives. So which would you choose? Your preferences or his? My first job, (laughs) my first job, one of my first jobs came when I was actually at TA. I worked at a day camp. And at this day camp, they had these overnight trips. And, you know, we were getting paid hourly. So I signed up for all the overnight trips. You get paid for the time you're sleeping. I just signed up for all of them. <laughs> we would get to the campsite, and it just seemed like we were in the middle of nowhere. It would be a flat plain and walls and bushes around. Not walls, I'm sorry, just trees and bushes around. And we would get there early, probably about 9 a.m., and we didn't know where the bathroom was. We didn't know where the water was. We didn't know where... You know, the zip lining, what the, we didn't know. We were just in the, this area surrounded by trees. But the counselors who were with us, they knew where it was. 
And they said, at that time, we were going to make, we're going to take the whole camp, we're going to set up, and then we're going to take our time and walk to each of these places. And as we walked, we forged a path in the woods. Joshua told Israel to choose you this day who they will serve. Choose you this day who you will serve. And I believe that he did this not because he was giving a charge, not only because he was giving a charge to the Israelites, but because he knew that when you chart your path to serve God today, tomorrow, it would be easier. Just like we were at the campsite, the next day it was easy to see, or at nighttime it was easy to see where the restroom was because we had already charted that path. Whether you're watching today online, listening here, in this room, or on the podcast, I will ask you to bow your heads at this time and speak to God. In the silence of this moment, for a few moments, just reconsecrate yourself to him. Renew your heart to him. Dedicate yourself to him. Heavenly Father, we're here this morning, gathered in your house to worship, and we know that you can do all things. We pray for your Holy Spirit to clean us out. We pray for your Holy Spirit to give us a new perspective, to enable us to be able to lean on you and trust you more, to seek your face, to enhance and grow our relationship. Father, you've already explained to us, you've already told us exactly what needs to to be removed in our lives. Most of us know it clear as day. We're thinking about it right now. And we ask for the strength, the courage to remove those things, to remove those idols, to break down those altars, so that when it is time for you to speak to us, we can hear you. We can respond to you in worship. Father, we're ready for a new a new chance. We're ready for a new walk, a new chapter. We're ready for something fresh. We're ready for something uh, rejuvenating. We We ask that you prepare our hearts just for that. And we thank you for your promise that you will never leave us. David said that we can go anywhere on this earth, under the earth, in the heavens, and you will always be there. We can't flee from your presence. And we thank you that you will never leave us or you will never forsake us. Thank you for your promise to forgive us. Thank you for your long suffering. Thank you for your patience. Bless us as we continue in worship is what I pray in your son's name. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. The song of response this morning is I have decided to follow Jesus.